Shalom and welcome to this week's edition of Pearls of the Torah. I'm Moray Matan, Pastor Matt McEwen, International Director for Ahavat Ami International. It's my joy to be with you again as we dive deeper beneath the surface and study the Torah together in a bit of a longer form and in a way that might be a little deeper than you are accustomed to. Uh, I want to recommend, first of all, my program with my wife, which is called the Rashi Nash. This is something that is a little more basic. And if you have not gone through a Torah cycle with Rashi, I recommend that you do that first before doing any type of deeper or uh, more esoteric uh, study because uh, we need to have a firm foundation. As it is said in Judaism, we need to have a belly full of meat and wine before we enter the Pardes, before we get into some of this deeper teaching. Of course, we are in this Torah portion this week of Noah. We are looking at Noah and the ark. As we are children, we love the story of Noah and the ark. We love the animals. We love the big boat. We love the rainbow. But obviously, there are some deeper things going on that we can look at as adults that are happening beneath the surface. This week, I'd like to talk to you about six points that each have a messianic insight tied to them. First, we're going to look at the ark itself and a tie into the Zohar. We're going to look at the rainbow and the covenant. We're going to look at the Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Babel and human pride. We're going to look at the dispersion of the languages and divine unity. We're going to look at the divine sparks spoken of in the Zohar and how we should gather those. And then finally, we're going to look at the gematria or the numerology of Noah's name and of his righteousness. So, as always, let us give the traditional Torah blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kedishanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and, and told us to be engaged in the business of the Torah. Remember, la'asok, to be engrossed from esek, to be in the business of the Torah. Let's get down to business today. So this Torah portion of Noah, it is filled with themes of divine justice, redemption, covenant, and the continual renewal of creation. Obviously, it's intertwined with deep and esoteric thoughts in Judaism. The first point that we're going to make is in the book of the Zohar, it depicts Noah's Ark as not merely a vessel of salvation, but a symbol of divine grace and enlightenment, a microcosm of the entire cosmos. If you'll remember, it took Noah 120 years to construct the ark, and no rain had fallen on the earth up to that point. And so Rashi and other commentators on the Torah say there are many different ways that the Lord could divinely and miraculously rescue Noah and his family. Why did he have him take such a long time to build such a large vessel? What is the point? Well, as it is said in Judaism, so that you should ask that hopefully people would come along and say, what is this that you're building? And then Noah could give the answer and say, well, there's a giant flood coming and God has told me to build this to be safe and you can get on this vessel as well. The idea was that people should stop and ask, why is he doing it? And so this is why uh, God does this. Now, the ark obviously represents a, a spiritual refuge, a sheltering of the seeds of all future life, both human and animal, both physically and spiritually. Now, if we look at a, a messianic insight that we should look at, that we can gather from this, the ark sort of prefigures Yeshua as a refuge, the ultimate refuge and savior, embodying grace securing spiritual enlightenment, and it also represents, Yeshua represents a new creation. Remember, it says in the Brit Chadashah that if anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creation. There's new creation. The old things are passed away, and everything is new. So just as the ark preserved the remnants of life from the judgment of the waters, Yeshua preserves us from eternal judgment, granting us entrance into God's eternal kingdom. Yeshua is like the ark that saves us from the coming wrath of God. Moving into the rainbow and the covenant. I have often thought, why is it called a rainbow? 
a rainbow. And then it was brought to my attention that it is a picture of a bow as in a bow and arrow. You know, if I were to hold a bow and arrow in my hand and pull back the string, wherever that arrow is pointed, that bow is going to make an arch. It's going to push outward. And if we look at the rainbow, the way that, is, that it is bent pointing toward the sky, if there was an arrow in that divine bow, the arrow would be pointing away from the earth as a symbol of God's judgment is not pointing toward the earth in that he will bring another catastrophic flood and destroy the world with water again. I think that's a wonderful object lesson of how to look at that, of the bow of God being pointed away from the earth. It's very interesting. You know, in Jewish mysticism, the rainbow symbolizes the seven emotional spherot reflecting God's glory. This colorful arch is not just a visual representation of God's covenant. It's like a synthesis of divine emotions and attributes revealing the unity in diversity. It's so amazing, the complementary nature of creation, male and female, God and humanity, animal and humanity. There are this, these interesting harmonies that we have, this unity that we have. Probably the one that means the most to me personally in my day-to-day -day life is the unity between Jew and Gentile. This is something that is a divine unity, and in that diversity, there is a strength. You know, we were not, as Gentiles, an afterthought for the Lord. We were always in the plan, and that gives me such a feeling of confidence and such a, uh, a feeling of love that the Lord uh, meant that even at the end, there'd be a multitude of every tribe and tongue and nation language that are waving the palm fronds there uh, because we are uh, waving that lulav together, you know, as we just uh, uh, recently, a few weeks ago, celebrated Sukkot. Now, a messianic insight that we, should, that we could look at uh, with regard to the rainbow and the covenant is the diversity of colors forming one unified arch can be paralleled with Yeshua's teaching on unity. You know, he prayed for his followers that they would be one as he and the Father are one. The covenant of the rainbow thus finds its fulfillment in the new covenant, promoting love and peace and unity among diverse members of the body of Messiah. The rhetorical question has often been asked, what does a Jew look like? Or what race, what color, what ethnicity is a Jew? Well, the reason that that is kind of funny is because there are Jewish people from every different background. After all, Judaism is a nation, a, a family, a, a faith, a religion that, that one can opt into. And so all throughout history, whether we have people like Ruth or whether we uh, look at uh, Caleb, whose family came from a Gentile background and joined Israel, we have this wonderful unity of Jew and Gentile entering into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb, a Jew and a former Gentile coming in. What a wonderful picture of unity that is. And may we be one as our Heavenly Father and Yeshua are one. Let us look now at Migdal Bavel, at the Tower of Babel, and human pride. You know, in Hasidic thought, the Tower of Babel is looked at as humanity's collective ego wanting to make a name for themselves. That's exactly what it says in the scripture. Let us make a name for ourselves by trying to reach the heavens by building this tower. You know, it's almost like a humanistic universal quest for not only autonomy to be apart from God, but also, dare we say, self-deification. I'm the God. I'm the one that's in charge. We see this in the scripture and the writings about the kings of Tyre. I will ascend. I will do this. I will do that. This ego combined with unity was a very dangerous combination. Remember what Hashem himself said, if they build this tower, they are in unity and one mind and heart and nothing will be impossible for them. This means that unity is not always a positive thing. Let us think back to World War II and the horrors of the Holocaust and the Nazi party and how unity gathered a nation together and a party together, but under an evil, maniacal, satanic leader, 
Unity is not always good. You could be unified in an evil purpose. So our unity needs to be not in pride, but in the humility that we see in Moshe Rabbeinu, in the humility that we see in, in Joshua, son of Nun, and we remember for our, from our teaching in the yeshiva that son of noon can refer to allegorically his humility, that the noon is bent twice, and so he is like a son of humility, but in Yeshua himself as well, humbling himself even to death. So this idea of self-deification finds uh, an opposite in Judaism, where we are trying to do a betul, we're trying to do a self-nullification, we're trying to humble ourselves. Remember, humble yourselves in God's sight, and He will be the one to lift you up. He'll be the one to raise you up. It's very interesting, and I've done a teaching on this before. If we humble ourselves, if we are to be raised, God will be the one to raise us. But if we raise ourselves, God will humble us. It is a spiritual concept that we need to remember. And also, just lastly on, on this point, what the Tower of Babel is doing is saying that we can ascend to the heights and we don't need divine assistance. We don't need God at all. It's basically thumbing our noses at God's divine nature. It, it's, it's a horrible thing. Let us not have that type of pride in our lives Amen and amen. Let's look at a messianic insight with regard to the Tower of Babel and human pride. The tower represents humanity's prideful endeavors to reach God through their means, reflecting our continual struggle with pride and self-sufficiency. Yeshua, in contrast, teaches humility and reliance on God himself, symbolizing the true and humble way to reach and know the Creator. We're not just trying to reach God. We can have an intimate relationship with Him. Remember, as we said last week, this is not about empty religion. This is about a relationship with Hashem that is sustaining to us and gives life to us, to our souls, and to our bodies. Now, Yeshua symbolizes the true and humble way to reach and know the Creator, encouraging a relationship based on submission to God's will rather than self exaltation. Remember, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Amen. Number four, the language dispersion and divine unity. The dispersion of the language at the Tower of Babel is a portrayal of division and separation, which is a consequence of humanity's rebellion against divine unity. Remember, Hashem is an absolute unity. Those of us that put our faith and trust in Yeshua as a Mashiach that believe that He is a divine manifestation in a human form of Hashem Himself, and we believe in the dwelling presence and the Shekhinah, in the Ruach HaKodesh, and we believe, as the sages say, such as in Bereshit Rabbah, that this is the spirit of Mashiach that is hovering over the surface of the deep. We recognize a unity in Hashem that is absolute. It is a misnomer and it is not factually accurate that we worship three gods. Chas v'chalila, that's idolatry. We don't worship a man, but we worship Hashem that had a divine fleshing out, a divine manifestation in the person of Yeshua. We do not worship the body of Yeshua. That is idolatry. But we do worship Hashem who was housed inside that goof, inside that body. So the variety in language is the exact opposite of the absolute unity of Hashem. And this variety of language creates a barrier, a stumbling block leading to misunderstanding and conflict. You know, we see this in our lives today. We see it in relationships, we see it in business, we see it in our marriage. When we don't understand one another, when we are speaking two different languages, so to speak, when that is the way that, that we are communicating, then we're not communicating at all. And that leads to fights, it leads to strife, and God forbid it can lead to divorce. Let's look at a messianic insight on point number four. The scattering of the languages and the subsequent Shavuot in Acts chapter two 
where the Holy Spirit enables understanding across language barriers. This is like a tikkun of what happened at Migdal Babel. This is what's going on here. This provides a glimpse into God's desire for unity. Yeshua's message is universal, transcending linguistic, transcending cultural, transcending, transcending national barriers and borders. We see this all over the world, this unity that can be had between different peoples, even people who come from very different backgrounds. It was amazing to see our dear brother carrying a Torah scroll into the country of Indonesia, which is 86% Muslim in, in a breakdown of its religious background. And our dear brother that brought in the Torah scroll and had to go through airport security and describe what this object is, was a former Muslim and a, a former leader in this Muslim faith, but he came to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and is now practicing Messianic Judaism. Praise be to God. This is so amazing. So all of this unity can only happen as a tikkun for the sin of the Tower of Babel. Now, Yeshua is the one that is the Prince of Peace, and He can bring together people of various backgrounds and give us that unity that He prayed for in the garden for us. Let's look at a couple more points, the Zohar and the idea of divine sparks. In the Holy Zohar, it speaks of sparks being scattered throughout creation, hidden within the physical realm, waiting to be elevated and returned to their divine source through human action. The narrative of Noah can be seen as a reflection of this concept and the flood as a mechanism for releasing and elevating these sparks. You know, it's interesting. We, we can see um, in our spiritual vision, so to speak, that there is a divine spark in everyone, that it needs to be elevated. We need to not be judgmental against people. We need to know that everyone needs the salvation of Hashem through His Son, Yeshua. Everyone. Even if there is someone that we would look at and say, well, that person is an enemy to me, or this person has a totally different life than me, this person is living in sin, this person is doing drugs, this person is a criminal. Listen, unless we are willing to look at that person and say, no, there is a divine spark that needs to be elevated and redeemed in even this person, no matter how low someone has sank, they are, I don't want to use the word deserving, because when we talk about grace, we talk about it not being deserved, but you know what I mean. Every person deserves a chance to be redeemed. And we need to not look at people as, as projects. We need to not check off our, our to-do list. I need to talk to this person or reach out to that person, but look at people as, as made in the image of God to look at people, no matter how different they are than us, that everyone needs an opportunity to say yes to Yeshua. That spark needs to be elevated. We need to elevate creation back to its original unity with the divine. Now, Yeshua, through His life, teachings, His death, burial, and resurrection, is the ultimate gatherer of these divine sparks. He unites and elevates the divine in humanity, reconciling the world to its creator. We see this so many times in the Gospels where he says, I haven't found faith like this in all of Israel. Where at first, as he was there just for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but then little by little, people that were very different, people coming from pagan backgrounds, people that were involved in sin, or people that were involved in, in various issues, he gave them time. He gave them care and concern. He gave them chesed, loving kindness, chen, and grace. He elevates the divine spark within them. And we need to do the same to the people in the world around us. Through Yeshua, humanity is given the chance to participate in this divine gathering. Amen. Last but not least, let's look at Noah's name and the gematria or the numerology of his name and to look at Noah's righteousness. The gematria of Noah is 58, which is the same as grace. What's interesting is the word for grace or chen is simply Noah's name spelled backward. So we have this wonderful tie-in of Noah and grace. It's the same word. Jewish tradition teaches us that Noah found favor or grace, chen, 
in the eyes of the Lord, and in turn, he reflected this divine grace back to the world, embodying reciprocity between the divine and human realms. Can you imagine that? It's like Noah, if you were to look at his name in a mirror, it spells Chen. And so he's like a mirror. He's reflecting God's grace back to the world. Now, let's look at our final messianic insight here. This reciprocal grace finds its pinnacle in Yeshua, our Messiah. He is the full embodiment of grace and truth, demonstrating how humanity can receive and reflect God's love and favor. Yeshua's grace is not merely unilateral, but it invites a response, a reflection of this divine grace back to God and to others. We need to remember that just as God gives us His love, He gives us His grace, and that grace needs to be through us used like a conduit to give that grace to the rest of the world. We have to remember that we are undeserving of God's divine favor, but Through His mercy, He gives us His grace. We need to give that grace to others. I hope this has been thought-provoking for you and that you have thought of specific instances in your life where you can make application for some of the things that we've talked about today. If you would like to join our yeshiva and learn in our school, you can go to shuvu.tv and fill out an application for the largest online Messianic Jewish yeshiva in the world. We are in many, many countries now. I I believe something like 60 countries. It's, It's crazy. The Lord is really exploding this school. And we now, of course, are about to formally release information on Shuvu College, where you can get uh, advanced degrees of master's and PhD level degrees in Messianic Judaism. I am currently in the process of, of getting my doctorate in Messianic Judaism, and you can do the same. So go to shuvu.tv to learn how to join the yeshiva, and later information about the college will be released as well. I want to ask God to bless you with all of his richest blessings this week. Shalom from all of us here at Ahavat Ami International and Koltuv. Tuv.